Good evening, everyone. My name is Hillary Bass. I practice law in Miami, Florida, and I have the privilege this year of serving as the president of the American Bar Association. So I welcome you all to this Law Day celebration and to this evening's program. This year marks the 18th annual edition of the Leon Jaworski Public Program to commemorate Law Day. We are so pleased to be here at the National Press Club in the heart of Washington, and it is now my pleasure to introduce you to the chair of our Law Day program this year, and that's my friend and partner, Jacqueline Becerra. Jackie? Thank you so much, Hillary. Uh, as the 2018 National Law Day Chair, I serve on the ABA Standing Committee that oversees the work of the Division of Public Education. The Division of Public Education has planned and organized uh, this program today for Law Day. I'd now like to say a few words now um, about this year's commemoration and why it is so noteworthy for us here at the ABA. It was exactly 60 years today on May 1st of 1958, that President Eisenhower proclaimed the very first Law Day. He did so in a nationally broadcast statement where he explained the reason for issuing the proclamation. He stated that he was doing so to remind us all that we as Americans live every day of our lives under a rule of law. In words that continue to resonate, he then added, Freedom under law is like the air we breathe. People take it for granted and are unaware of it until they are deprived of it. All over the country today, we are marking the 60th anniversary of this national commemoration. It's being celebrated by bar associations, courts, schools, civic groups all over the United States and even overseas. They're organizing educational programs for young people and adults to increase their understanding of the principle of the rule of law and law's essential role in American society. The ABA provides vital leadership and resources to assist these efforts. I've been so pleased to be part of this effort and to be with all of you during the course of the day uh, as your National Law Day Chair. Thank you and please enjoy today's program. Thank you, Jackie. Um, the ABA is again pleased to partner for this program with the Federation of State Humanities Councils and to welcome the Civics Renewal Network as a partner. In addition, this year we are partnering with the American University Washington College of Law Program on Law and Government and to have Steve Wormale as our program moderator. Our program tonight features a debate and discussion related to this year's Law Day theme, separation of powers, framework for freedom. We will consider positions for and against the following resolution. Separation of powers is essential to the preservation of liberty. This language comes from Federalist number 51. In that essay, James Madison, the father of the Constitution, wrote <coughs> of that separate and distinct exercise of the different powers of government which to a certain extent is admitted on all hands to be essential to the preservation of liberty. And yet, in the earlier Federalist 47, Madison also felt that he had to defend this soon to be ratified US Constitution from its supposed violation of the political maxim that the legislative, executive, and judiciary departments ought to be separate and distinct. He did so vigorously suggesting that the new Constitution's critics had totally misconceived and misapplied that maxim. How should we understand what separation of powers means, then and now? What if constitutional government blends as well as separates power? What role does separation of powers, or more broadly, the constitutional power structure, play in sustaining political liberty? How does it apply to what Justice Robert Jackson called in Youngstown Sheet and Tube, quote, the actual art of governing under our Constitution, end quote. In our program tonight, we will consider separation of powers as an ideal 
and as a practice. We will debate and discuss its meaning, its purpose, and its relevance for 21st century governance. This public program is named in honor of a great American lawyer and an ABA leader, Leon Jaworski. He is especially renowned for his role in Watergate. Following the Saturday Night Massacre, firing of Archibald Cox on October 20th, 1973, Jaworski was appointed as the second Watergate special prosecutor. Soon, he would be the center of one of the most significant separation of powers cases in our nation's history, United States versus Nixon. In that landmark 1974 case, the US Supreme Court ruled unanimously that President Nixon must obey Special Prosecutor Jaworski's subpoena and produce the requested Oval Office tape recordings. The court recognized limited executive privilege but gave preference to, quote, the fundamental demands of due process of law in the administration of justice, end quote. Just weeks after this momentous decision, Nixon was compelled to resign from the presidency. A few years before his Washington tenure, Leon Jaworski served as the president of the American Bar Association. While president, he established the committee that developed the ABA division for public education. A bequest from his estate in 1983 established an endowed ABA fund in his name. This endowment continues to support ABA public programs, including ours here this evening, which are dedicated to furthering public understanding of the law and its role of, in society. Now, to begin our program, I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator, Steve Vermeil. Steve is the professor of practice of law in the American University Washington College of Law. He specializes in law and government, constitutional law, the Supreme Court, and the First Amendment. Before joining the American University Law Faculty, he covered the Supreme Court for the Wall Street Journal, reporting on and interpreting more than 1,300 Supreme Court decisions. As ABA leader, Steve has chaired the Individual Rights and Responsibilities section, now known as the Civil Rights and Social Responsibility and Social Justice section, currently serves on the Standing Committee on Gavel Awards, and in August will begin a three-year term on the Board of Governors. We look forward to having you, Steve. I'm now delighted to turn the program over to Steve Wormiel. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Bass. <coughs> it's an honor to be here and to serve as your moderator. Um, the, the support that the ABA is showing for Law Day and for this particular debate is wonderful. We have President Bass here. We have President-elect Bob Carlson here, Jackie Becerra, who's the chair of Law Day. Um, we thank the Public Education Division for their support for this program for so many years. Um, and, and for making the commitment to helping people understand the importance of Law Day and the rule of law as part of our constitutional heritage. Our topic, um, chosen in keeping with ABA tradition by President Bass, uh, is separation of powers. It is, I think, known to most people in this room, but we'll remind you, not a concept that is mentioned in the Constitution. There is no express reference to separation of powers, nor, as I think we're about to hear, um, is it clearly defined in our understanding of our constitutional system and what it means. And yet it's something um, that has held our attention and devotion um, for, for decades, if not centuries. I had 175 students take a constitutional law exam this morning and one of their two essay questions focused largely on separation of powers. So um, <laughs> I did it in honor of law. No. Uh, so today we'll explore the dimensions of separation of powers um, in a debate format, although with apologies to the Oxford Union, we will be somewhat more for informal than the, than the uh, traditional debate style. Our topic, again, as Hillary said, resolved separation of powers is essential to the preservation of political liberty, 
Um, our speakers will have seven minutes to make their main arguments, and then three minutes for rebuttal. Um, and then we will, I will pose a couple of questions, and then I hope by that time you will have a long list of questions as well, and we'll be happy to hear from you. Um, speaking for the proposition will be Professor Victoria Norse of Georgetown Law School and former Congressman Mickey Edwards of the Aspen Institute. Speaking against the proposition, Professor Edward Rubin of Vanderbilt Law School and Professor Laura Donahue of Georgetown Law School. Forgive the brevity of my introductions. There are long and well-deserved introductions in the program, and I hope you will look at them. I also will urge you, uh, because the uh, Public Education Division has put a huge amount of work in thought into the program itself, to read some of the quotes and excerpts in the program reflecting on separation of powers. But after we're done, not right now. Um, so with that note, I will turn it over to our first speaker in favor of the proposition, Victoria Norse. Thank you very much, Professor Vermeil. And I think this is an extraordinary testament to the ABA. It's a wonderful program, something I've thought about for a very long time. But I only have seven minutes, so i got to get to it. Um, it goes without saying that there is no liberty with, uh, under a dictator. The separation of powers exists, in my view, to prevent the concentrated power of the executive. I first became enchanted by this idea after I'd worked as a lawyer in the Senate for a number of years. And then I started teaching at law school. And I was thinking about what I would say. And I wanted to tell them that everything I learned in law school was wrong. A little bit of experience was dangerous. Um, so I'm going to start at the beginning where I started to try and understand this as an academic. I'll start with our war with Britain, that revolutionary one that we won. And I'll start with those in Britain who were the Whigs who taught Tom Paine in common sense why we should have a separation of powers. Uh, the Whig pamphleteer Trenchard was a very important uh, source for Paine. And he had something very interesting to say against the king at the time. The king had a parliament, and he had common law courts. So it appeared to be something of a separation. But Trenchard said, what shall be done when the criminal becomes the judge and the malefactors are left to try themselves? How may the commons redress the grievances occasioned by the executive part of the government if they should happen to be the same persons, unless they would be public spirited enough to hang or drown themselves? He was talking about a king who in name had separation of powers, but in fact did not. He had bought, the king had bought the parliament by giving them places. They were called the placemen uh, in uh, his executive uh, department. There was no parliamentary system that would go forward in America precisely because of this political experience. We have a constitution that bars a parliamentary government and increases the, uh, and, and entrenches the separation of powers explicitly. It provides in the incompatibility clause, something you never learned in law school, that in fact Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell cannot sit simultaneously in the executive branch, because in fact the executive would then fold into the legislative. Now that gives you a little bit about the history about why we have a strong tradition of the separation of powers and why it prevents the joining of the executive to the legislative, lest that be an enormous way to impose uh, <clears throat> concentrated power on individuals. But I now want to get on to something I call the schoolhouse rock version of the separation of powers, because I think it's wrong. And I've written a lot about this, and I'll tell you why I think it's wrong. It's a bit unusual. I'm going to ask you to engage in a bit of an intellectual experiment. Most people think that the separation of powers is about something called the executive, the legislative, <clears throat> the judicial, and that these adjectives actually can be enforced by courts and described in some specific detail. I think that view is wrong. The Constitution's text itself, as Professor Vermeil told you, does not separate functions in any complete way. We know that there are shared powers, but I bet you didn't remember that Article I, which was about the legislature, actually includes a huge presidential power. It's called the veto. And then there's Article III, which you thought was really about courts. And in fact, it allows Congress the power to get rid of inferior courts and to create them. So the Constitution does not have an explicit separation, and that was intentional. In the Federalist Paper, Madison spends a long time, if you read them sequentially, you'll see from 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, you'll see that he did not want to have a parchment barrier. 
When Justice Scalia talks about the separation of powers, he cites the Massachusetts Constitution. Why? Because these provisions had failed. Why had they, had they failed? Because the due foundation for the separation of powers, as he talks about in Federalist Number 51, had not been laid. One thing that had not been laid was corruption. So the government in, uh, the governor in Philadelphia, uh, in Pennsylvania, would ask for a raise every time he was supposed to sign a bill. This was the part of the due foundation that Madison describes in number 51. Our salary and tenure provisions in the Constitution are not taught as constitutional law, but they actually support the identification of the individual or the man with the place. This was only one part of the vision, which I think is instinct or embedded in almost all of the provisions of the structural constitution before the Bill of Rights. Why? Because in fact, the, the key to uniting was not only protecting against corruption, but representation. And this is where I'm gonna ask you to engage in a bit of an intellectual experiment, which is different from anything you've ever learned about the separation of powers. And that is that I think the reason we have separate institutions is because the leaders of those institutions are elected by separate constituencies. So the president is elected by a nation, the senators by the states, representatives by local districts. Madison knew this. He believed that this was most, one of the most important provisions securing a separation of powers, and why? Because this was an incentive for the person in office, not only to release political energy, but to restrain it. Why? Because if you, uh, serve to the nation or the states, etc. there would often be different interests, and those interests would necessarily conflict. That's the restraint problem. So this is different from no, looking at this as executive, judicial, and um, other adjectives, because in fact, it suggests, as many political scientists have, that a separated power system versus a parliamentary system is both more resilient and more resistant to dictatorship, as we know from Latin America, South America, not to mention Weimar, but it is also a system that allows and is better for voters. They get to complain, not only to the states, but to the president and to the two, two branches of one department, namely uh, the Senate and the House, and then to courts. And these institutions, with their own incentives, get to fight about the public's interests given those incentives. Now, that's a very different way of looking at it. It's more like a political scientist, but I believe this explains why the separation of powers is not a particular provision in the Constitution because it's embedded in the very structure of how we elect a president um, and a Congress. Now, our history shows that it's very difficult, in my view, for a president to actually control this system. There are many people who think our Congress has become weaker, more partisan. There are many problems with Congress. I teach a lot about that. But I do think that it's important to recognize that the, we have not, we have survived 200 years. Many constitutions last only somewhere six to 19 years. And we've done that because we have restricted the power of executive <laughs> to become a dictator. Thank you. All right, our first speaker uh, against the proposition is Professor Edward Rubin. Okay, uh, so thanks. Uh, so I think one way to start is to be clear about what we're talking about. Separation of powers does not uh, mean judicial independence. I think we can all agree that judicial independence is crucial for uh, a uh, fair regime, for a democratic uh, regime. We want the people who, the institutions that adjudicate the rights of individuals and the status of individuals not to be subject to political pressures. But calling that separa uh, separation of powers as a term is over-inclusive, under-inclusive, and non-descriptive in terms of judicial independence. It's over-inclusive because many of the regimes that we identified as not having separation of powers, Sweden, the UK, Japan, uh, Italy, have judicial independence. Uh, and uh, many, uh, and they are able to uh, maintain just as fair adjudications as we are in the United States. It's under-inclusive because uh, the majority of, uh, of adjudications that are done by, in the federal government are done not by Article III courts, but by Article II courts, that is to say, as part of the executive. The Social Security Administration alone uh, um, decides about 10 times as many cases as the federal courts. 
Um, there are uh, about twice as many deportation cases as there are cases in the federal courts. Uh, deportation isn't even done by an independent agency like the SSA. It's done uh, by an agency within a cabinet department. And yet those adjudications are done fairly and are done consistently uh, with due process. So you don't need separation of powers for that. And finally, it's non-descriptive. It's non-descriptive because that's not what we mean by uh, judicial independence. Judicial independence doesn't depend on where the adjudicator is located in the government. It depends on certain structural features, such as tenure in office, such as salary protection, and such as um, other features that are connected uh, with that. So when we're talking about separation of powers, what we're talking about is really the difference between a parliamentary system and a presidential system, not judicial independence. So now the question is, is a um, presidential system more protective of liberty than a parliamentary system where there's no separation between the legislature and the executive? Now, uh, just as an empirical matter before getting to the conceptual matter, the answer to that has to be no, uh, for the same reason I just mentioned, namely that among the parliamentary systems in the world uh, are included Sweden, the Netherlands, the UK, uh, Japan, Italy, uh, and uh, those nations have just as much liberty as we do. And uh, in fact, uh, all of the nations that I just mentioned uh, have uh, at this point um, higher, uh, are more protective of individual liberty than we are and have higher ratings from Freedom House than the United States does. So that's as an empirical matter. Uh, as a conceptual matter, let me just uh, begin that with a little story about a shoemaker, uh, let's say four or five centuries ago. So here's a shoemaker, uh, and uh, he has people working for him, apprentices, um, and they'll tend to be either his relatives or the children of a neighbor. And so, uh, first of all, they're a small number. He knows who they are. He's not likely to be as a, uh, particularly oppressive toward them, and uh, uh, he's uh, not inclined to be uh, particularly mean to them because uh, uh, he knows them and he knows their families. Uh, he sells shoes to people in the community uh, and those people uh, know who he is. So if there's something defective about the shoe, they know to complain to him. And they're just as likely to be higher status than the shoemaker as lower status and have more access to dispute resolution functions, whatever they are, as um, the shoemaker. Uh, the shoemaker may um, uh, pollute the environment in various ways. He may discharge uh, some uh, uh, chemicals into this local stream or emit noxious fumes. But again, the people who are going to suffer from that are his neighbors, and there is likely to be high status as low status. What's happened in the last two centuries is the Industrial Revolution. And that has completely changed the texture of life as we live it in the Western world. Now, we have large industrial firms that uh, employ thousands of people and can use them and use them up as they wish because they have no personal connection to them and they're not answerable uh, to them or, or, or their families. We have a consumer culture where consumers are remote from the factory that's producing the goods, have very little access to the factory and cannot on their own maintain any kind of legal action against the factory. The factory has overwhelming power, the industrial um, uh, institution with respect to them. And the same is exactly true for environmental damage. Uh, the people don't even know where um, noxious fumes or pollu uh, pollution is coming from, and they have no capacity to take action against uh, the emitters of uh, those um, uh, uh, environmental hazards. The regulatory state was created to deal with those problems in modern government and modern society. It's the regulatory state, it's the system of regulation that protects ordinary people as employees, and it protects them as consumers, and it protects them as citizens who uh, have, live in the environment. So uh, now back to uh, parliamentary versus um, uh, presidential systems. It is, it is true that in a uh, parliamentary system, it is easier for the government to get its programs through. That will seem to be uh, a, and there are more impediments in a uh, presidential system, that will appeal to you as a um, 
uh, mechanism for uh, uh, avoiding oppression and preserving liberty if you sympathize with business people, if you sympathize with business organizations. They're the ones who are being regulated and controlled by uh, the regulatory process that we have. On the other hand, if you sympathize with ordinary people in their capacity as employees, in their capacity as consumers, in their capacity as people who live in the environment, their liberty is being protected by the regulatory state. And so the notion that separation of powers uh, protects liberty is just false. Uh, it depends on who you sympathize with and which side you're on. I personally am on the side of ordinary people. Uh, other people may differ, but in any case, understand that this is a politically loaded position. It is not a neutral one, and it depends on the relationship that you have to the notion of regulation, because regulation protects the liberty of ordinary people and infringes on the liberty of business organizations. Thank you very much. Congressman Edwards. Well, thank you. It's uh, an honor to be invited to be part of this. Uh, I want to start, we have two givens in, in the proposition itself. One is that the proposition is that we're looking for liberty. It's not about security. It's not about efficiency. It's not about whether other benefits might flow from a different system. It's whether or not liberty is protected by separation of powers. The other uh, proposition is uh, that separated powers uh, help you have your liberty is protected, so you have two opposition points here. It's either separated powers or it's concentrated powers. There are some overlaps, but our Constitution does specifically, very specifically, have separation of powers. It does not use those words. It separates the powers. It separates the war power. It separates the taxing power. It separates the spending power. You know, very, very clearly. So there are overlaps, but there are clear assignments of authority to one branch and not another. So um, I, I want to, Madison was referred to before, I'll use a different quote from Madison, in, also in Federalist 47. The accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, whether hereditary or self-appointed or elective, must justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. So. Madison and Hamilton disagreed on a lot of things, not on this one. Uh, powers are divided not just horizontally, but vertically between the federal government and the states. And Hamilton said, quote, a double security to the people. If one encroaches on their rights, they will find a powerful protection in the other. So I'm not going to just refi or, you know, refer to people who are long dead. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she was being considered for appointment to the Supreme Court, said, Justices of the Supreme Court do not guard constitutional rights alone. Courts share that profound responsibility with Congress, the President, the states, and the people. So when you have separation of powers, what does it do? It provides multiple points of entry, multiple opportunities for input, multiple opportunities for reflection and deliberation and people, time for people to mobilize against uh, infringements on their rights. And the importance of separated powers is almost universally recognized. Britain, for example, uh, has very much separation of powers. The, the courts in Britain, they cannot rule something unconstitutional because they don't have a written constitution. But the courts do and, and can and do rewrite laws, for example, to, co to uh, fit with the European Convention on Human Rights. The House of Commons has the power not the prime minister. It's only party loyalty transcending other things that makes it look like it's a unified government. But some two dozen times, the, the parliament has voted, House of Commons voted no confidence in the prime minister even when he's of the same party. And he has then had to, or she, to uh, either resign from office, have new elections, uh, or rewrite their policies. So the, let, let me ask, does a system of separated powers work? Does it work? So let's look at some things that happened, not just 9-11, which we, you know, is kind of a sitting duck, the Alien and Sedition Act. Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Act, the president signed them, the next president said that's ridiculous, and he restored the liberties to the people who were convicted under the Alien and Sedition Act. John Peter Zenger, even before that, before we were a country, uh, libeled the governor of New York, I was against the law, 
uh, and the court, they went to a jury, and the jury said, we don't care what the law is. You know, we're going to say, you know, they, they established freedom of the press uh, and uh, freedom of the courts. Uh, gay marriage. Gay marriage was not getting anywhere in the, in the courts. It was not getting anywhere in the Congress. So the states began to uh, enact gay marriage. State and local uh, governments have been asked by the federal government to, um, to carry out our immigration policies. The states said no. It's a vertical separation as well as positive. The Pentagon Papers. The Pentagon, the President of the United States says, you shall not publish. The court says, the hell you won't. Uh, th this is what the separation of powers is. President Roosevelt, FDR, tried to pack the Supreme Court and make it just to carry out his policies. Congress, his own party, said, no, you're not going to do that. Neither Congress nor the states did anything about segregation in schools. So we got Brown versus the Board of Education. When the courts narrowly interpreted the Voting Rights Act, Congress passed new laws to broaden the protection. The courts, the House and Senate, the presidency, the states, separation of powers opens multiple avenues for citizens to be heard, to enlist the aid of one or more branches of government to protect their liberties. So as Madison said, concentrated power is the very definition of tyranny. So therefore, ergo, the separation of powers is the definition of a system designed to preserve liberty. Thank you. And Professor Donahue. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> for centuries, our country has looked to separation of powers as a sort of panacea, a remedy for ambition, a, a, a bulwark against tyranny. Alexander Hamilton and Federalist IX did invade this wholly new discovery he wrote in the science of politics that enabled self-government. And Madison went on in, in 47 to talk about his absolute belief in separation of powers, saying no political truth is certainly of greater intrinsic value or is stamped with the authority of more enlightened patrons of liberty than separation of powers. And it's become this kind of constitutional de rigueur to refer to separation of powers as it's intrinsic or essential to liberty in the United States. It is not. We do not have separation of powers in the United States. To the extent that we do, it is not promoting liberty. In fact, it is very restrictive of liberty in many ways. And third, the third point I'll raise tonight is if we're serious about freedom in the 21st century, about protecting against tyranny and preserving rights, then we should be looking to the corpus of rights, to rule of law, and to an educated citizenry to prevail. So on my first point, we don't live in a separation of powers. Part of this stems from the design, as Vic noted early on. Madison explained in Federalist 47 that we were to divide the branches, but to have overlapping powers between them, that the hydraulic pressures would keep the genie in the box. Justice Jackson did reflect in Youngstown that while the Constitution diffuses power, the better to secure liberty, it also contemplates that this practice will take those dispersed powers and combine them into a workable government. It enjoins upon its branches separateness, but interdependence, autonomy, but reciprocity. So bicameralism and presentment ensure that executive and legislative enactments become law, even as the court makes law through its judicial review. No more so, as Vic noted, are the courts insulated from the legislature's determination of their jurisdiction, and so on and so forth. Three political developments have made it actually worse in our lifetime. First and most obvious is the evolution of political parties. The founders hated political parties, they despised them, and yet, as professors Daryl Levinson and Rick Pildes have written and observed, they now serve as the primary vehicle for mobilization in the United States. They create alliances amongst constituents and office holders that cut across these political boundaries that the founders put into place. When a Democratic Congress does what a Democratic president wants it to, or a Republican Congress does what a Republican president wants it to, separation of powers is dead. The second political development is the extent to which separation of powers has been able to staunch the growth of corporate power. And as my colleague eloquently noted in a post-Citizens United world, politicians themselves are beholden to corporate America, not to defending freedom. Separation of powers means nothing when senators and presidents alike are beholden to the same entity. And third, enabled by complicity from all three branches, we've seen the rapid growth of the administrative state. By the court's own admission, these independent agencies have quasi-legislative, 
quasi-judicial and quasi-executive functions, which blur the lines between the branches and make them unanswerable to the electorate. And so to reiterate the first point, we do not live in a system of separation of powers. To my second point, to the extent that separation of powers exists, it is failing to protect liberty. In his second treaties of government, John Locke laid out the functions of government and emphasized the importance of dividing between them because it might be too great a temptation to human frailty, apt to grasp at power. For the same persons who have the power of making laws to have also in their hands the power to execute them. And what Locke shared with the generation that founded this country was the common view of human nature, of the ambition of man. What is government, Madison wrote in Federalist 51, but the greatest of all reflections of human nature. Sadly, separation of powers has not been able to oblige our government to control itself. I could choose from many areas. We have very little time here tonight, so I'll focus on one, which is secrecy and secret law. For even where separation of powers is present, Secrecy and secret law are eating away at our rights. Consider the government's tight control over information. In the intelligence community, there are 17 agencies that control classification. As of 2016, there were more than 2,200 original classification authorities. They made 39,000 original classification decisions and more than 55 million derivative classification decisions. What good is separation of powers when nobody knows what one of the branches is doing? And what about the law itself? Well, despite separation of powers, it's not just government information that's hidden from view, but the law. Since 1979, Sissy and Hipsy have passed annual, for the National Intelligence Program, the Annual Intelligence Authorization Acts. Together with the DOD's Appropriations Acts and the National Defense Authorization Acts, all of them have classified annexes that determine how that law is to be applied to the American people. That is completely cloaked from public view. We have presidential directives, which are issued through the National Security Council. The law does not require that those are published in the Federal Register or the Code of Federal Regulations. Despite the classified nature of those documents, the Office of the Counsel to the President has consistently advised the President that they are binding on the people of the United States. Or the OLC opinions, the Office of Legal Counsel, has an entire corpus of law which is secret and unpublished. Some of the memos that come to light raise very serious questions about individual liberty, the right to torture, to use coercive interrogation methods, to detain using our military, to detain US citizens, to have broad intelligence collection, and to target US citizens using drones. All of these have a direct impact on liberty, and yet they are subject to separation of powers, and still we see liberty eking away. Perhaps no better example can be brought to mind than the surveillance system. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court was founded in order to grant warrants or orders in particular cases. It now has more than 60 opinions it's issued, and we found that despite separation of powers, for nearly a decade it was operating a program that impacted every person's rights in this room. When that program finally came to light, Congress changed the law. They ensured that the court appoint amici. They made it illegal to collect bulk metadata under Section 215. The President's Review Board declared the system illegal, and the Privacy and Civil Liberties Board con uh, considered it unconstitutional. It wasn't the fact that there were separation of powers. It was the fact that it came to light, and the public knew what was happening that brought it to bear. And so to my final point, Separation of powers does not protect liberty. It cannot even ensure that we know what the law is, much less the myriad ways in which our rights daily are being violated. If we're serious about freedom, about protecting against tyranny and preserving liberty in the 21st century, then we must look to the corpus of rights, the rule of law, and an educated citizenry to prevail. Thank you. All right, I think we got off to a pretty lively start. Um, we're going to give each of the speakers three minutes to uh, rebut or cover other ground that they want to cover, and I think we'll go in the same order. So, Professor North. Okay, so, all right, we don't have powers. If you define powers as sort of <clears throat> executive, judicial, et cetera, there's sharing. Of course, there has to be sharing. You don't have any checks, all right? If they were just three silos, they couldn't check each other. The problem is when you try to connect this background structure <clears throat> with more specific applications. I agree that the regulatory state is going to privilege large corporate interests. They're repeat players. So the courts privilege them as well because they're repeat players. They can uh, send their high-priced lawyers into court to get their way. 
But that doesn't mean we want to change the underlying political structure of the United States. <coughs> the underlying political structure relative to other forms of government allows for an enormous release of political energy, which is a safety valve. Multiple factions means that we have never had, I'm sorry, until you know maybe recently, anything that approached a dictator. That is an extraordinarily long run. That's an extraordinarily long run. Democracies are very fragile. So yes, I can agree that we shouldn't have secret law. I can agree that the regulatory state prefers corporations to individuals. But that doesn't tell me anything about how I want to structure my constitution, whether I want to look at it more like, and there are different variations, as all of us know, whether we want to look at more like Switzerland or more like Sweden. I think there are policy benefits to all of those things. I am nervous, particularly in this environment. I think this environment has shown us the importance of a separated power system. Leon Jaworski certainly knew about a separated power system when he went to court to fight a president. And so I will insist that there are virtues here. Those virtues are not simply courts cannot enforce this. That is something I think we can all agree on. It is a republic if we can keep it. The dangerous thing here is not about secret law. It's not about the regulatory state. It's that our election may have been stolen by Russia. Professor Rubin. Well, uh, the question, if we're talking about separation of powers as a means of governance, is uh, what is the contrast? So um, some of the comments and uh, uh, some of the rhetoric uh, uh, in the Federalist Papers uh, suggest that the contrast is a, is a dictatorship. Concentrated power in the sense of one person exercising all the powers. I think uh, we can all agree that that's a bad thing. Uh, if the debate were, uh, should we have the American system of government as opposed to Stalin? I don't think we'd have too many people <laughs> on the other side. But that's not the contrast. The contrast is between the United States and Britain, or the United States and Sweden, or the United States and the Netherlands. Of course we want democracy. Separated powers versus parliamentary systems are the two basic means of organizing a democracy. And the question is whether one is better than the other and one is more protective of liberty than, than, than the other. And that's what we're talking about uh, it, here, is liberty, not, not, not effectiveness. And I think we're just kidding ourselves if we think that the separation of powers is something that will really protect liberty. Yes, I think it, um, it will tend to favor an anti-regulatory position for the most part over a regulatory posi uh, position, but it's not going to secure our freedoms, as Professor Donahue uh, was uh, uh, was noting what secures our freedoms uh, is our electoral process, um, it's the openness of government, it's the um, ability of citizens uh, to monitor uh, the government. The election of um, Thomas Jefferson and the uh, thereby repeal of the Alien and Sedition Act isn't an example of the separation of powers. It's an example of elected government, of the people uh, getting um, uh, 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 fed up with or re uh, revulsed by uh, someone who was beginning to claim uh, dictatorial uh, uh, powers and beginning to uh, infringe on the rights that Americans held dear and saying, no, we're, going to uh, uh, we're not going to reelect that uh, person again. Maybe that's something that will happen in a couple of years. Uh, it's to be hoped for. But it's the, you know, the, the mechanisms for liberty are things that need to be taken very seriously. If we kid ourselves and say, oh, uh, a uh, presidential system is more protective of liberty than a parliamentary system, and therefore the separation between the executive and the legislature, or the division, uh, or, or, or divisions of uh, administrative agencies to bifurcate those functions, we're not. We're going to miss the basic point, and we're not going to protect, uh, protect liberty, and we'll leave ourselves open to the coalitions of interests that can truly undermine it. Thank you, Congressman Edward. Well, a couple of things. Number one is all of those parliamentary systems you mentioned have separated powers, every one of them. They're not the same powers necessarily. They don't have one person who's a dictator who can just make everything happen. So, so we have to get to the definition of what is separated or what is, there's only separated or not separated. There are overlaps, but there's a separated or not separated. The second is I, I completely agree 
with what you said, but I think the examples you gave, and I wanted to cheer everything you said, <laughs> but every example was not about the separation of powers, but about the abandonment by the modern Congress of the separation of powers. Uh, by party trumping any, I don't want to use that word, by party <laughs> <laughs> taking precedence over upholding the special responsibilities, obligations, constitutional duties of the branch of government that is supposed to serve as a check. That's not because the system doesn't work, it's because the people who currently occupy those positions are deferring to the executive branch if that person is a member of their own club. So it's the party problem that, that you have. Uh, and, and, and to use the Alien and Sedition Act thing again, what really happened was that the Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Act. One president signed it, but the next president was able to say, I'm going to give you your liberties back even though you were convicted, you know, because the president could step in. That's a separation, separation between the Congress and between uh, and the executive. So I, what I've heard mostly is areas in which the, the separation of powers is not being carried out as intended. Uh, it, it is true. I, let's say, it won't always work. It won't always work. But it will work a lot better than if you have concentrated power in the hands of one person or one institution. So it's better than not separated. Professor Dunning. Great, thank you. So th I would make three points in response to that. Um, on the first, it's not, um, what I was discussing was not a party problem. So for those of you who are less familiar with how the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court works, uh, the uh, Congress passed a law, uh, Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act after 9-11, which uh, allowed it to collect business records if there were reasonable grounds to believe that the information to be obtained was relevant to an authorized investigation. Now the executive branch acting as, the, so this isn't a party issue, the executive right. branch interpreted this secretly, that all Americans telephony metadata is potentially relevant to terrorism investigations. Therefore, we can collect everybody in this room, all of your telephony metadata. And in fact, they did that for almost a decade. Now, the executive branch, under this law from Congress, went to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, made the proposal, a judge secretly accepted this, and this program went into place. So we have separation of powers here. We have separation of powers without the American people knowing what was going on and how this legislation was being interpreted behind closed doors. When that became public, all three branches of government reverberated because the electorate went ballistic. So the president had to appoint a review board. The Privacy and Civil Liberties Board, which had been defunct since its origins, suddenly took steam. We had Congress pass a new law, the USA Freedom Act, making it illegal to do bulk collection. The difference was not separation of powers. The difference was that people found out what the government was secretly doing. The issue was secret law in that particular situation. On the second point that I want to bring up on the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, this is a matter of departmentalism. It's so interesting you bring that up because separation of powers in a system of judicial review post Marbury versus Madison, it's the court that weighs in. But what you're referring to is a system in which it wasn't the Supreme Court that came forward and ruled right. on the constitutionality. This was a departmentalist system that went into play so that state and local governments, you had federalism, you had all sorts of different ways. You had the pardoning power. That's not a classical separation of powers case. Um, and the third point that I would raise is it is meaningless to talk about separation of powers unless you first talk about rights. It makes no difference to rights if you have separation of power without the basic protection of those rights. It makes no difference to have separation of power if you have secret law. There is then no control in a democracy of the sovereign over the organs of government. And it makes no difference to separation of powers if that sovereign does not know how the government is acting and is an educated sovereign, an educated population. And so I would come back to my original solution to this, which is separation of powers might be the panacea that we frequently quote, but without this, these ideas, the corpus of rights, without rule of law, and without education and knowledge and understanding, we do not have freedom. Thank you. Thank you all to the panelists. Um, I want to pose one or two questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So please have your questions ready uh, in, in a couple of moments. Um, I'm going to ask you to think outside the box for a moment and think about this in a slightly different way. Um, our wonderful, one of our wonderful hosts in the public education division, Howard Kaplan, did a lot of work on this program. And I want to ask about something that's in the program. Um, there's a wonderful quote from author-historian Gary Wills, 
who says that our government structure is not like a seesaw with the branches tottering back and forth, but more like a Calder mobile with the parts counterpoised. And if you look at the cover of your program for a second, you have a Calder mobile with the parts counterpoised. Um, so my question is, what's your image of our government structure? Is the Calder mobile the right image? Is it some other form? What represents the issues we've been talking about today in terms of image? I can uh, st start. I wrote a book about this, actually. Um, so the dominant image uh, of government for a long time wasn't the Calder mobile. It, it, it was a, um, the human body. In other words, the, 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 the structure of government was conceived as a human body with the prince being the head and the military being the arms and the peasants being the feet and that kind of thing. And this was replaced um, in the uh, 18th century by this image of three branches of, go uh, of government, something that uh, the framers had in mind because they were reading Montesquieu. And Montesquieu had gotten, because he visited uh, England in, in um, uh, 1728, and inscribed in his book the exact balance of the Walpole administration between the king, the courts, and the parliament at that time under Robert Walpole. And so that was that image. That image doesn't really work anymore, as, as uh, Professor Donahue was saying. That's not really what we have. So I propose that we think of it in terms of a network of interacting parts. And really, um, the, uh, the interactions between elements of government do not correspond to that separation of powers. Staff contacts between, for example, the legislature and the executive are intense and often determine the actual machinery of governance. We do have judicial independence. That is crucial. Uh, but we don't have these three uh, branches in any, in any workable sense anymore. We certainly don't have them with respect to executive agencies, which, as Professor Donahue pointed out, combine all three functions. Anyone else, different, different version of the image? Well, I think the Constitution is a house, um, and it's a structure. Uh, it's not as modernist as this. It's rather ancient. And we've had to keep building on as the people need more room, right? And a lot of it is jerry-built. And some of it has perhaps uh, fallen down. Some parts of it we've had to resurrect and move. And, because the people themselves have changed. The Constitution empowers people, which means that although the text stays the same, it also hints that it will have to change. The house will have to get larger and be transformed in many, many ways. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't think that when we look at the separation of powers, it's not trying to put our government back into some kind of adjectival sort of sense of who's in the executive, who's in the judiciary. Um, but I, and I do think that they share powers. That's the only way they can check. But this building is something that we build out every election. I mean, that's something I think that a number of the panelists agree upon the importance of an educated citizens can read because that is in essence what the separation of powers is. If they don't like the president, they get rid of the president, they change their vote, they change it with respect to the Congress, et cetera. That is the beginning of it. What the government looks like on the ground in Washington can be sometimes very different, but also sometimes very much. I have been working in the Senate, and believe me, if you think you're pre the president's going to veto your bill, you're not going to be happy with that, right? That is. Um, the way this kinds of work. You need to get agreement on these things, and that's because they are, in fact, in separate libraries or rooms in the bottom of the building, which has been built out by the people around them. So I might see it diff slightly differently. Um, you know, when I think of this, you know that flag, don't tread on me, and the snake, you know, kind of curled up from the Revolutionary War. Um, I think of it as a series of spirals that we have, not unlike that snake, that spiraling mm -hmm. snake. Um, and the reason why is, so if you think about, for instance, uh, national security laws or counterterrorist measures or surveillance measures, if, 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 if a terrible event happens, the first thing 
that the legislature thinks is, gosh, if we had known about this, we could have stopped it. So they pass new laws to get more information. So they weaken their surveillance or strengthen their surveillance provisions, weakening individual rights. And often, these are seen as somewhat of, uh, in violation of rights. And so they make them temporary with the idea that they can later repeal them. Uh, and so by making them temporary, they're more palatable. And so they introduce a new measure. It's temporary. But the story of both the United Kingdom and the United States, I've written a few books on this, is that these temporary measures then become permanent. And because to repeal them, you have to say, well, no level of terrorism is ever likely again, or we accept some level of violence. And we're not going to do any of those things. So what happens is the measure goes into place, it's made temporary, and the next time there's an attack, it expands and it expands, and you have a spiral. Or we have an administrative state, and we have a social issue at the you know, early first quarter of the 20th, 20th century, and we have the growth of this administrative state to deal with the social issue, and then the administrative state grows and grows and grows. Or we have a Cold War, and we have a spiraling of the national security state and the national security apparatus, so that everything now is interpreted within that national security apparatus. So there are these series of spirals that go on. And the question is, at what point do we as citizens either support or help to reduce those spirals? To what, what point do we say, no, that's enough, that's now unbalanced, and we need to bring that back within balance in order to have balance within our system? So I think of the United States more in, in these series of concentric spirals that go in various directions, and whether it's education or whether it's military or whether it's uh, administrative agencies, that, that our job is then as citizens to figure out, okay, that's enough, and now we need to bring ourselves back into balance. I, I hate to say this. I, I think I see it, if I were trying to look at it the way I actually see it at the moment, I, I see two boxes. I think there's one off to the side, which is the courts, the independent courts, which we need. And one, one very large dominant box, which is the executive branch. And one very small uh, box <laughs> that once was large, equally <laughs> large, uh, and is now very, very tiny. Uh, as we go through a, a period here, where we have presidents claiming uh, a unitary executive where all of the agencies and departments must do uh, what the president wants them to do with virtually no complaint about it. Presidential signing statements. I was honored to serve on the ABA's task force on presidential signing statements, you know, where a president from my party says, you know, the very interesting piece of legislation you passed and I signed, and I'll now decide whether or not I'm bound by it. Um, uh, but we, we now, um, you know, we, we may or may not go to war somewhere, Korea, Syria, wherever, uh, but one thing I do know is that everybody in this room and all the people who are waiting on the tables in the, in the cafeteria here and everybody out on the street and the members of Congress will learn about it at the same time because the, the Congress has basically abandoned its role. Uh, it has uh, acceded to a, uh, an executive-dominated dominated state for whatever kinds of reasons you want to say. Part of it is party, party loyalties. Uh, part of it is lack of courage. Part of it is not willing to have uh, your fingerprints on an unpopular policy. So uh, I think the real problem, when you start listing everything about the FISA court, I've spent a lot of time on those kinds of issues, what you see more and more is a Congress derelict in its duties. And, and when uh, the founders believed that the people in each branch would be uh, jealous of their prerogatives and stand up to defend them, they had never met Paul Ryan or Mitch McConnell. <laughs> so that's a perfect segue into the, another question I'd like to ask and then I do hope the audience will, will be ready in, in, in one moment. Um, part of the discourse of this debate about separation of powers is that we use the terminology co-equal branches of government. Um, clearly, I don't think anybody on the panel thinks we're talking about co-equal branches of government, but where does that come from and why do we keep using the, the term? Is it an ideal or, or is it un totally unrealistic? Well, I, they're not equal in each of the areas. There are areas in which the president is, uh, uh, has complete authority. Uh, the president's veto power, the president's pardon power, which we have seen recently, uh, are very dominant. I mean, when you think about the, the power of the veto power, 
you know, that the, the House of Representatives votes 435 to nothing to overturn a veto, and the Senate votes 66 to 34 to overturn a veto, the president wins. So, I mean, it's an enormous power there. Uh, the Congress, if it asserts itself, has the only war power. The idea that commander in chief means you decide whether you go to war is nonsense. Nothing in history in any country that ever had commanders in chief meant that they were the person who decided whether to go to war. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think it was intended that in your, in your area, in, in the area that is spelled out in Article 1, for example, or in Article 2, that is your domain. Uh, so then, then you were equal, but uh, again, I don't, I don't think that's the case anymore. Yeah. Well, equal is a, quanti a quantifiable term, and I, I don't, I, you have to find out how you measure what power is, and, and you'd also have to decide what power, is it a power as prescribed what you may do, a direction, or is it the power of the people? You know, if you work for anyone who has been in office, um, I'm sure Mr. Edwards will validate this, they're constantly trying to figure out what their constituents want them to do, and that when they feel like they have the power of the people, they will act in that way. That's a very different idea of power. So I think it's a very hard question to ask or answer. Um, in light of developments, we all know, um, uh, you know, the Congress not standing up to various things, and yet being very insistent that President Obama would never get anything passed. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think it waxes and wanes in such a way that it's almost impossible to answer whether they are equal at any particular um, moment in time. So, uh, you know, I would go back to, the, I guess there were two points I would raise. I'm going back to your earlier point on this. Uh, the, you know, the failure of political leaders to take their oath to the Constitution seriously. Um, when the Constitution was designed as co-equal branches, all three branches were to determine whether something was constitutional or not for itself. And when legislators leave the Capitol and say the courts will clean it up, I, I see that as really a gross abdication of their constitutional duty Absolutely. to actually abide by constitutional tenets in there. And in a way, this goes back to Marbury versus Madison, which in a way was the worst decision ever because <laughs> it created a get out of jail free card so that legislators could try to push the line that the intelligence agencies could get chalk on the cleats and count on the courts to clean it up in a world in which often the courts never see this or are not able to push back against the executive branch in this way. And so, at the same time, when I think of Marbury versus Madison and the circumstances that gave rise in the election of 1801 and how badly they acted, remember that John Marshall was both Secretary of State and Chief Justice at once, never mind separation of powers, right? Never mind that we have this idea that our congressional numbers are so much worse now than they were then. Look at 42 Justices of the Peace, the changes to the um, Justices Act and uh, the Judiciary Act that were put into place at the time to try to derail the Jeffersonians. You know, the, the, they were acting badly then as as well. And yet, there was an understanding and a grasp of the importance of standing up for where you sit in order to push back. And we no longer have that. We are losing that in our system, and that's why separation of powers is not working. And we have to look at these other ways to ensure that we have a base of rights, that we have rule of law, that we have people who are educated and know what's happening. Otherwise, these separations mean nothing. Well, I would agree with that. I also agree with uh, Mr. Edwards that, uh, you know, uh, we no longer have that, uh, the government has changed, we no longer have that equality. I mean, if you think of the three branches as representing a tree, uh, one of the branches is 100 times larger than the other two, just in terms of the number of people working there. And that's a pretty ugly tree. So what we need to think about is mechanisms for control and mechanisms for preserving liberty in the context of a modern state where the executive has so much more authority because of the needs for managing the state, because of the needs for protecting individuals in their role as employees or as consumers uh, or as uh, citizens in the environment. And those mechanisms are not going to be uh, solved or developed or, uh, by invoking uh, 18th century imagery about branches and trees. All right, I think we're ready to open it up to audience questions. Just, um, what, do we have a microphone or? Yeah, thank you. I'm Judge Burnett, and I've served with two presidents. And indeed, I was the assistant judge 
Mr. John Sirica as a magistrate judge in the federal court handling pretrial proceedings in the Nixon matter. And I may be accused of being the guy who found the missing 18 minute tape. And I was the reviewer and deputy judge, you might say, to surrender. But the question I have is no, none of you have discussed the power of impeaching the president. And the big issue now is whether or not a Democratic House, if elected in November, will move like a grand jury to impeach President Trump for exceeding his powers and leading us to a dictatorship. And whether the Senate, depending on whether it has a majority or not, like Nixon, we will see another Nixon campaign. I was chief counsel and legal advisor to Jimmy Carter from 77 to 80, and we frequently dealt with those questions of the power of Congress and also, also was involved with the Archibald Cox operation and so forth and the power of the president. The issue now come up whether the president has the power to fire Mueller. Mueller appeared before me as a judge for, three and a, for a year and a half on these issues. But to the extent, and Scalia raised these issues, of whether the special counsel has greater power than the chief of justice, the chief, chief person or the chief executive branch president of the United States. But if he defies Mueller, will we see an impeachment proceeding? So I've heard an inadequate discussion of what impeachment means in this country. Thank you indeed, for the question. Indeed, I was the potential replacement for Clarence Thomas had the Senate rejected him. And I probably would have been more of a Kennedy justice, 54 justice uh, senators uh, confirmed but I went through 14 hours of, gil of grilling by the first Bush administration. I was considered a hybrid. I'm a kind of Kennedy, partial Democrat, partial Republican, but looking at the merits of the issue. I'm celebrating my 60th year as a member of the law of this jurisdiction. Yay. And 58 years of being a member of the American Bar Association. And I indeed made history in ABA because I was the first black judge that chaired a conference of special court judges in 1974, 75. So some are like hidden figures. I've been a <laughs> hidden figure in the drama of the separation of powers. And I was a plaintiff in Brown versus Board of Education. I was a case in front of Little Rock and the issue of state versus federal and whether the federal government overrides states. And today I had a commission appointed by the Episcopal Church of the United States to finish the unfinished business of Thurgood Marshall and Martin Luther King combined to eliminate discrimination and bias in government operations in this country. All right, thank you, Judge. Thank you. Anybody want to talk about impeachment? Well, I'll say a word. I, first, I want to compliment you on what you, the very first thing you said, you served with two presidents. I am so tired of people asking me how many presidents I served under. I've never served under any president. <laughs> served with other presidents. So, uh, uh, you know, I just want to say about the impeachment, uh, two things. One is, if you're a member of Congress, even, even if your opinion of the current president is as low as my opinion of him is, and it would be really hard to be, you know, more critical than I am. Uh, a member of Congress of either party is still going to take very, very seriously whether or not to overturn the results of an election. You know, impeachment is not something that can be done cavalierly because the guy's a jerk or because you don't like his policies. You know, so I don't know what will have been found that will cause the, the Congress. It doesn't need a reason, by the way. Congress doesn't need a reason, it can, it can impeach. But it's not, something, it's not something you take casually, no matter what you think of the person. And I'll tell you, I will share here a worry I have when I express it, people think I'm nuts. Uh, people think I'm nuts anyway. But Andrew Jackson, when the court ruled on the Cherokee displacement, said, you made your decision, let's see you enforce it. 
I am not totally sure that if the Congress impeached this president, that he would say, okay, I guess I'm gone. And, and I think that's a, that would be a constitutional crisis like none we've ever had before. Uh, but uh, this is not somebody who, you know, just goes along easily when somebody corrects him or tells him, no, I'm sorry, you have to quit. So I, I worry about it a lot. I, and I don't know uh, whether or not impeachment actually would happen. It, take, it takes a big step when you take the oath of office to overturn the results of an election. That's, that's, that's big. So I just want to make one observation about the question, which is the assumption that Democrats would act and Republicans wouldn't act. I mean, this yeah. is what I'm trying to get at with this idea that political parties have overridden separation of powers. So it's not Congress acting, it's Democrats acting when they control Congress, or, and Republicans then opposing that on party lines. And that's exactly what I'm talking about, the sense that separation of powers, that political parties override these divisions that otherwise were supposed to create checks and balances. Yeah. I, I think if you press from a pragmatic point of view, I, I said this a year ago, watch the Republicans. This is what happened in Watergate. You saw some Republican defections, and then that will be a signal to the Democrats who are trying to say, well, this has been too, this has just tortured the country too much. That that's what it will take. It won't be, it won't be easy for them. And it won't, I don't think it will be enough if it's a party line. All right, we have a question here. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Dee. I'm a lawyer, a practicing lawyer here in Washington, D.C. My question is for Laura, but first, I'm also a graduate of Georgetown Law School, okay? so we're, we're equal. Um, your use of the word secret court, secret laws, let's pretend I'm the executive. Maybe I want to give you this information. Um, maybe I'd like to give you this information, but maybe you wouldn't understand this information, and that's why I'm withholding it from you. But you talk about the FISA courts, but also we have the Freedom of Information Act, and you can get a lot of information, and you can, you can do a FOIA request to the military. You can make freedom asking the Army to give you some information. But what happens um, regularly is that when you give a Freedom of Information Act request to the Army, they give you more information than they should. Uh, they're not that careful, and so it, to say secret laws, secret courts, why should I give you information? You're a law professor at Georgetown Law School, and let's say I'm the, milit the FISA court. Why should I give you that information? You might not understand it. Yeah, so, um, so thank you for your question. Uh, my response to that would be, well, first of all, we're talking about matters of law. So I, I think there are some things that should never see light of day that, that are classified, certain um, method sources that, that are properly classified. When we're talking about what the law is, that the language of the USA Patriot Act, that you had reasonable grounds to believe that the records to be obtained were relevant to an authorized investigation, that they were interpreting that to mean all telephony metadata, potentially all gun records, potentially all education records, potentially all internet records, potentially that, that all of that was included within that, that's a matter of law. And to say to a citizen, I don't think you're gonna understand this. These are your rights on the line. Every American in this room had their rights affected by this secret interpretation of the law. That law should not be secret. To the extent that it is the law, the law needs to be public. That is what it means to have rule of law. And if you go back to the common law history, the high, whole concept of common law is that you know what the judicial decision is so that then you can use it in the next court case that comes forward. So I'm actually one of the amici for Fisk, and I just had a case before them. Um, and the court just ruled on this case whether we had standing to ask for access to a judicial opinion. Not, not the merits claim under the First Amendment, but do we even have standing to go into a court and say, we have a right to ask for access to the law? And the government's position in this case was, Actually, the government has the right to classify any judicial opinion so that nobody can ever know what the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court rules. So in preparing the Samikas brief, I went online and I tried to find as many declassified redacted opinions that had been formally released from FOIA requests. I found 60 of them. None of them, well, no, sorry, two, two or three of them were on the court's website. The rest were all over the internet because a FOIA request is the way to actually get this information. Now, that is crazy in a system that's governed by rule of law that we can't go to the court and see what the court has actually decided in these cases. Now, there might be redactions within those opinions, but to know what the law is. We have a First Amendment right of access to the law. It was, this is what happened to the common law right of access. It was incorporated through the right to petition into the First Amendment. That was 
seen as the most important right, not press, not assembly, the right to petition. You can't petition your government if you don't know what they're doing. And so that right to access judicial opinions is in the First Amendment, and that is one of the rights that we have. And I think it's pejorative to say to citizens, you wouldn't understand the law, we're not going to give it to you. We're the sovereign in the country. We need to know what the law is if we're going to be able to fulfill our obligations as citizens. So. Anyone else? Totally agree. Uh, we have a question. All right, we'll take this one here and then we'll go to that side. So picking up on that, um, Congress has given itself the authority to reveal classified information. They have a very careful process they go through. I don't think it's ever been exercised all the way to the end, but in theory, as a co-equal separate branch, they have said the executive branch can't keep information classified uh, if we think there are important reasons to bring it out. Similarly, members of Congress don't get clearances because they don't want the executive branch to have the power to, de to look into their background and deny them a clearance. Judges, most don't well understand this, but judges similarly uh, have access to classified information by virtue of their um, position, as do governors. The question that I would ask uh, the panel is, uh, just as Congress has given itself the authority to reveal classified information, do we think a true separation of powers, and I, what I hear the panel saying is separation of powers is maybe necessary but not sufficient, that it, that, that it is not something that, that is bad for liberties, but it hasn't necessarily been, we can't be complacent that it will be the answer. But should judges have the authority to reveal classified information as a co-equal branch? Absolutely. <laughs> but that, you know, there's, I, I just, this is a very strong view, and I actually just wrote a brief on it, it's online, um, you know, talking about this in some depth. So it's House Rule 10 that they can declassify, but also HIPSI and SISI, the House Permanent Select, Permanent um, Committee on Intelligence and the S Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, both of them have rules that they can also declassify, they can make it public, they can declassify it to certain members of Congress. Um, you know, Congress retains this for itself. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court retains it in their rules. Both the Court of Review and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court has in their rules that they can and they may or may not actually consult with the executive branch. The executive branch's position is we can stop you from publishing anything. And when I went through the 60 opinions that I found online, one of the things that struck me was the amount of government malfeasance that was going on when they were querying databases without reasonable articulable suspicion, when they were querying databases for totally unrelated criminal activity looking for potential criminal wrongdoing and end run around the Fourth Amendment. When they weren't doing, when the, they told the court one thing and then they came back and it turned out they had been lying. Um, you know, Reggie Walton got very upset in some of these opinions because they had been lying to the court. This is the kind of thing that people need to know. And the idea that the executive branch can tell the courts, no, you may not tell people what you know about our bad actions. You know, that, that actually harms the legitimacy of the judicial system because the people can't see them pushing back on the executive branch. And it harms the legitimacy of rule of law. So absolutely, the courts can declassify material and make it public. Uh, Chief Justice Lamberth, when he was uh, presiding judge of Fisk, he actually, there was this great case, Horn versus Huddle. And it turned out that the CIA had been lying to him and he just declassified the whole case and opened it up. And that's what the courts should do. They are a co-equal branch of government and they have the right to do that. Let, and I not, not only agree with that, but let, let, me, let me back to the, the reason the, the, the executive branch classifies is because Congress legislatively gave that, job, that authority to the executive branch and it can claim the authority to itself. I have been appalled by the fact that members of the executive branch will come and testify before the Intelligence Committee and tell members of the Intelligence Committee, and you can't tell any other member of Congress, uh, you know, and you can't tell members of your staff, at which point the right answer to tell them is stick it. You know, you, you know we will declassify what we want, our staff will know, our, all our colleagues will know, we have the oath of office. You're, you're not you know, the sole arbiter of this. And, and I think the idea that the executive, can, there, there's no greater danger than a government that is able to keep secrets from the American people. 
there should be examples of, of exceptions. You know, there are things that, de you know, that expose uh, people who will be put in danger because of this. But the idea that presidents can tell uh, either Congress or the courts, you know, you can't say, you know, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. Presidents have gotten carried away, gotten away with it way too long. But see, this is just exactly the example of what I, I, I think uh, we've been talking about, which is we have these uh, separate institutions, and they all turn to jelly when the, when the flag of national security is waved, and they all give in to this notion that the, uh, the people uh, don't have the right uh, to know. So uh, going back uh, to uh, the case where uh, the, CIA, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court allowed the CIA to keep its budget uh, secret, even though the Constitution requires that the people be informed. And the Supreme Court decided this on the grounds of standing. People didn't have standing to sue. So people, we have a right, but no one can enforce that right in the, in, in the courts. So we have you know, all the supposedly separate and protect, uh, 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 gov uh, branches of government that are protecting liberty all doing the same thing, which is succumbing to this fear of uh, foreign threat and succumbing to this fear that if information is disclosed, that'll be used incorrectly. And it's that failure of our own sense of courage and our own belief in our system that's causing the problem here. And separation of powers isn't going to solve it. It has to go back to our own attitudes and our own, own, own beliefs. Let me just say that I think uh, the questioner had it absolutely right. It's necessary but not sufficient. So we can go back in history when there wasn't so much jelly. There's the church committee. You know, there have been congresses that have pushed back. I came here to Washington from Paul Weiss in New York as a very young lawyer to work on the Iran-Contra Senate investigation with a very fancy lawyer named Arthur Lyman. So, you know, and that was a bipartisan committee. It was Warren Rudman and, and in a way. These things can happen in my lifetime, right? So I've seen them. I do think that it has changed since 2000. Um, I do think there are abuses with the national security power. There's no question that that happened after 9-11. I mean, when I got here in Iran-Contra, I met a person who claimed that the very, their very existence was classified, OK? So <laughs> that they existed, you know? It was absurd at the time. It has only gotten much worse after 9-11, and I have complete sympathy with the frustrations that courts, and I think more courts should be active in that kind of thing. It doesn't answer the problem of whether we want to change our ultimate system with a very strong Congress. We just need to get a stronger Congress, and people need to start electing people, emphasis on political solution here, electing people who will stand up for Congress's prerogatives, because when you do elect people who will stand up, at least in my lifetime, they have done it. Well, and Iran-Contra grew out of uh, a congressman from Massachusetts named Eddie Boland, who passed the Boland Amendment right. that stopped the funding of the Contras. Which and, is why and they had to bring it. So, so North tried to get around it. You know, yeah, he right. had to bring it inside the White House because yeah. Congress said, no, you can't. Yeah. All right, we have time for one last question, and we've promised it back here. So. Yeah, here comes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. All right. I just wanted to say thank you so much to the panel for this discussion and how we all should be thinking in terms of maintaining the, maintaining the integrity of democracy. Um, to echo Mr. Edwards' sentiments earlier about having a unitary characteristics of our current federal government and the system, my question is for Professor Rubin. You had mentioned that the separation of powers can be considered both over inclusive and under inclusive. And I just wanted to know if you felt that by having certain administrative agencies in the courts that are, are, that are regulated by the executive branch and whether they're considered as being not unfair when we have certain derivatives and certain orders from the attorney general who's telling courts that they must maintain performance reviews, such as for DACA cases or for um, asylum cases in the immigration courts, that they have to bump up their um, numbers from 678 cases to 700 cases per year. Do you feel like that is still a fair system given the different separation of powers with the branches? Well, I think what's crucial in that, in that case is uh, the independence of the uh, adjudicators and their willingness to uh, stand up 
uh, to uh, uh, demagoguery and stand, stand up to uh, a uh, ability of someone to generate a, a sense of hysteria and uh, reach decisions that are um, uh, unpopular with certain uh, uh, groups of people. Uh, I, I think that, um, that kind of uh, courage to, to uh, maintain uh, the rule of law is crucial to, uh, and it's, it, it's a difficult thing because uh, it's hard to know how to uh, encourage that or to generate it. It's nice to think that we can do it with structure, and it's nice to think that structure alone. Uh, Madison, who we've invoked a number of times, um, one of the reasons he liked structural solutions so much is he had a very deep cynicism about virtue and about the uh, uh, ability of people to regulate themselves. So uh, I think uh, that uh, he looked to structural solutions, and I would say that they only will go so far. Ultimately, if everybody want, uh, loses faith in democracy, we, we, we won't have it. But the other point is we need to keep thinking about new structures. We have to keep thinking about new ways to uh, encourage uh, people to stand, uh, stand up to power and to embody our sense of freedom in things that work in, 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 in the modern uh, world and that will deal with modern problems uh, when, when, they, uh, when, when, they, when they arise. So uh, I, I think, um, uh, you know, just going back to this notion of, oh, uh, uh, we have uh, three separate branches is, is, is not the solution. We, 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 need, we need a lot more. And, and since Ed is a former law school dean, I think we're going to give him the last word <laughs> and say thank you to the panel. And... It's the last time I've had the last word as a law school dean, I have to say that. Thank you so much to our moderator, Steve Wormiel, and to our incredible participants today for an incredibly informative and provocative discussion. So please join me in thanking our panelists. This concludes our Jaworski lecture for this year. I want to thank each of you for being here and participating with us, and I look forward to working with you on next year's Law Day. So thank you. Have a good evening.